Hi, I'm Rigor. This is your right. I want to talk about cyberpunk edge runners. Let's do that. Deep dive into the world of Night City. But I think it's only fair that I start with a little background. I am not a cyberpunk expert by any means. However, I am familiar. I haven't played any of the video games, but I've been a fan of listening to some of the TTRPG games, I've played in one or two adjacent properties that aren't technically cyberpunk, and I used to be in a circle with some people who really love cyberpunk, so I have my footing at least. I don't know all the slang, but hey, I ain't no new man, if that makes sense. So, while this is technically in cooperation with CD Projekt Red and for the 2077 video game, I'm more approaching this as someone who knows the TTRPG a little bit. I actually had no real interest in the game when it came out. I'm actually not that much of a gamer. I do enjoy games, but I don't play a whole lot of them. But when I saw they were making this show, I was obviously interested. It's a great world to play in, and I was very excited to see something like this, especially done by such a visually interesting animation studio that really fit the aesthetic. And what I want to say is, at least approaching it from the TTRPG side, is that this show is a perfect advertisement of what playing at least that game is like. This is the cyberpunk experience. It's just straight up and down cyberpunk in all the positives and negatives that come with that. But first, I'll start with a quick summary. It's all about David, except it's not, but we'll get to that. So very quickly, David Martinez is attending a corporate school, but is exceeding his means by a long way. To make that happen, his mother is working overtime as a medic and doing what anyone who wants to get ahead anywhere in Night City does, shady shiz on the side, like selling recovered cyberware. After just an average day of high-speed gang shootouts, David and his mum crash and are left to die because they weren't insured enough for the medevac. It's not a client. Neither is she. Hey, wait! You're the policy holder. Leave that for the city meat wagon. In heartbreaking fashion, David is then told his mother will survive, before the next day being told, whoops, she didn't, should have had more coverage. With literally nothing left, David ditches his school after beating up his bully, which he does by getting this random military grade cyberware he found with his mom's belongings installed because hey, fuck it, why not? After which, he meets a mysterious and alluring woman named Lucy, who is just jacking people's chips on the train. David will slowly work his way into the crew alongside her, fall for her very hard, who actually does the same, and very quickly things get out of hand because this is cyberpunk. It's honestly at this point I just recommend you go watch it, because while I started out wanting to just review the show, I instead want to operate as if you've watched it because I want to discuss the show. So rather than hiding spoilers, or you listening up to the episode you're on, or listening to Halfway to see if you'd like it, I'm just going to assume you've watched it, because you really should, it's really worth your time, it's not that long, and I want to talk about certain things that I can only do if we just discuss the whole thing in full. One thing I will say is I've been hearing around that if there's one thing that isn't the strongest here, it's the plot. And that is kind of true and kind of not. The plot is cyberpunk, it's not special in that it's cyberpunk, it's every cyberpunk plot, but that's fine. I admit, writing some of the lines could use a little of the work, some of them are a bit cringy, but that's primarily not helped by a combination of the slang used, Seriously, Jim? A Satara? Fuck me! Zelda! And also the very sort of stilted, to the point dialogue people talk in, which is the cyberpunk setting, those fit, those are meant to be there. But when those are thrown around constantly and then you get like the more plain but cliche or like dramatic lines that sometimes don't seem to work right. It's always been a part of me. I'm built different. I just know it. Those are the ones that sort of could have used some more work and stand out. They just don't seem to fit some of the others. But it's not a deal breaker by any means. I also did find that sometimes the simple style that people speak in, or I mean the very condensed style people speak in, sometimes didn't allow me to buy in as much to the relationships between the characters, at least initially. Like, between David and Lucy's relationship, I really like it, but to start with, in episode 4 when they finally come together and then they... ...come together. I actually didn't buy in as well because the conversation between them leading up to the big kiss really didn't click that well. That's good. I like that. You know, the idea that you weren't lying. What if I'm lying now? Seriously doubt it. Why not? Just don't see it. <laughs> Crazy. 
Wish you'd said something earlier and spilled it right away. It felt very disjointed, but it's fine because afterwards they do so much good work to pull them together. It's not some great big problem, it just adds a little bit of barrier to entry to some of these initial startups on these things. And next, you're all going to giggle because I want to talk about something that I actually think of really seriously, but is going to sound very weird when I say it. Because this is one of my favorite things that this show does that not enough shows do. They did really good nudity. And I know that sounds really bad, but I mean it, just hear me out. I actually very seriously mean this. We're in cyberpunk, where life is cheap and living is expensive. That's the whole point. The streets are awash in depravity. There's just everything happening in public. People just getting off in public, there's people just getting shot in public, there's blood everywhere, there's high speed chases, there's drug use. People don't even pay attention to it, they just walk by it. If you happen to get shot with a stray bullet, that can just happen, I'm sorry. And to really sell that excess, you need to see everything, which is why, you know, the rating has to be pretty high. We see a lot of gore. And we see some pretty sexual things, but I actually want to move past that into just how this story handles how we look at these characters, because I think it's not unique. Well, it is sort of unique, but it shouldn't be. This should be how this is handled, and I'm so happy it was. It, as an adult person, I am so happy it was handled like this because it adds so much to the story. Is that it got over the nudity thing very quickly, that I wished we as a society would just do. Especially, especially in something animated, especially when it's anime, because Western animation usually doesn't go there, and anime, when it does go there, is so childish about all this. I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to enjoy something R-rated because I wanted an adult experience, and it's some guy freaking out because he saw someone's chest jiggle, and it's screaming, and oh my god. And it's so childish and so over the top, whereas this used those things to build the world without any of that childishness, and I really appreciated it. And I will go on about this, I have some things to say. Because this show does what most anime could never do in just a couple episodes. In four episodes, they've met, they've kissed, they've been together, they will be together multiple times, they will date each other and be a couple, and the show can go on, and we can use those things in the story. And it's not a huge deal, we can see them wake up next to each other in bed, and it's not a big deal, it's how life is. One of my favourite scenes for this was a bit later, and I think it's episode 7, they're both completely nude, just sitting next to each other talking as a couple. And they're both going through some bad stuff. Both of them just happen to be nude, because they're at home, and they've been doing different things, nothing sexual happens, no one makes a comment, the camera doesn't linger, it just is them talking as a couple. It's just part of the scene. But equally, the camera doesn't zoom in and show everything off, but it also doesn't awkwardly cut at angles to perfectly hide everything. It's just there. It's just life. And it makes these people so much more human. Despite the fact I had trouble getting into their dialogue, scenes like these made me buy them as real people, more than anything else could. Here they are, both of them chromed out, and part of the story is one of them especially is losing their humanity, and yet they're more human than most animated characters because they can do this. They can be people. And this is where I want to praise it. It's almost like it takes this world of extremes, of everything being so over the top, just to bring normal relationships up to normal level, for just being how the world operates. And this is what I would like to see in more stuff aimed at adults, but we're adults. We can watch this. We all have these body parts. I just found it really refreshing and it really helped me with the characters and is what I want to see more of in things that are aimed this way where it's suitable. And now I've done a whole section about nudity and sex, I hope you're all paying attention because I have other things to talk about. Because the next one I want to talk about, I really appreciate how Lucy is written, especially in regards to the emotions she gives. She could be the stereotype, super cool, mysterious hot girl who the main character chases, and she starts out as that. She's the alluring strange one, a bit mysterious, and there's all this mystery about her. And she ends up being a bit quirky when we first meet her, and there's lots of characters like that. But where this one shines is when we get past that. She opens up pretty quickly, and yeah, we have a backstory episode about her later on, but even before that, you learn about who she is. She doesn't just vanish out of every scene weirdly. You see her come and go. You understand why she does things. And one of her most endearing traits end up being love. It's how much she loves David. It's actually rare to see it written like this. 
Not only do the cool elusive characters often not get to show the kind of emotions, this may sound weird but it's just refreshing to see, especially for the female in a hetero relationship to get that in sort of an action show. The don't you dare mess with the person I love thing. Without it going crazy, yandere, that kind of thing. I'm more worried about David. Especially if that dick pops the EMP again. It won't pop shit if we zero him. <laughs> You're pissed, aren't you? Just a little. Just being a person, letting all these people have these emotions. In a show that emphasizes the losing of humanity being so serious, we get some of the more human characters. All these chromed out people are so human in this field, this landscape of anime that really struggles sometimes to make these people feel real, like you should care. Seeing Lucy get motivated and aggressive when people put David in danger and the lengths she goes to later on to protect David because she loves him is fantastic to see. And you see the lengths that David goes through to get to her, but you also would commonly see that. See the male protagonist doing anything for the girl he loves, but to see it reciprocated that way, and to see this actual relationship, and to see how much they care about each other really gets you invested quite quickly over a short show. Getting back to the plot though, we do have this central issue that always surrounds cyberpunk stories, and that is cyberpsychosis. You need the chrome to survive, but eventually the chrome will get you. Edge Runners perfectly weaves this in as the bookmarks of its story. It's central to the plot and they use it in all the right places. It's immediately introduced, opening the show. First thing we see, a cyber psycho going nuts. How dangerous that is, and how serious that is. And then, it's right after the halfway point, in episode 6, we see it strike the team. This is not just something scary to experience, but now it's happening to your people. And then, right at the end, for the climax, it comes back and strikes our main characters. It's a perfect use of this key element to the cyberpunk experience and story. Seeing immediately how terrifying someone with cyberpsychosis can be because it automatically comes along with being chromed out sets up what can go wrong. Then halfway through we get the father figure of the team and the mentor figure for the main character be struck with it. And while it doesn't go as badly as it could have, you also get to see what it's like through their eyes, that disconnected feeling, the way time's jumping around and visions are happening and the way they're seeing the world and it brings it all to light, just what's happening to their mind and you get inside the mind of a cyber psycho which you thought would be completely violent but it isn't necessarily. It shows you what it's like and all that builds to our climax of what someone is willing to do. It all becomes pretty haunting in its own way, and that's what I really want to talk about too, is the tone. Initially, I was worried about how they would handle the tone for something aimed at a more general audience about this subject, because Cyberpunk is one of those games that you don't really win. A bit like Call of Cthulhu, if you actually win, you're sort of not playing it right, or the GM has weird ideas or is being far too nice to you. In Cyberpunk, you should always feel stepped on, manipulated, and barely holding it together, and in the end, even if you win, you kinda lose. It's all about the ride along the way. Because every cyberpunk game basically ends the same way. You might win a personal victory, but the corporations are still there, the world keeps going. Even if you take down the big bad, they were always just someone else's pawn under a bigger bad. And like I said, I was initially worried that might be lost, and those fears were brought about when David was special. Because that sort of thing in cyberpunk is no one's really special, you're all just people and you have limitations. But of course he's our main character so he's a special. He's more resistant to cyberware, which in a cyberpunk setting is pretty much the best power you could have. And he of course gets to use that through the show, but you realise really he might be special, but he isn't invincible. And that really the more special one for the plot is not our main character, which is great, it's actually Lucy. So that's more fantastic to me, that thank god our protagonist isn't just the ultra special one because that gets tiring. But like I said, those fears were alleviated in episode 7. Because after we lose multiple teammates and we come back after a small time skip, suddenly David is not only more significantly chromed out, but he's running the crew and Lucy isn't with them, so there's real ramifications for what happened. That's when my faith was a bit restored, as well as we start seeing David go through some issues. He isn't invincible to cyberware. And that's really where I was assured that this would not end well in the best way, because it shouldn't. Honestly, the fact that one person gets a happy ending almost feels like too much. 
but they still have to live a horrible life of loss and went through a lot of pain to get there, so we'll give it a pass. That's just how cyberpunk is. I was totally prepped for everyone dies ending, and they would have been warranted in doing that too. I think if you were to criticize the actual characters, David does suffer a little bit from average protagonist syndrome, but in the same way he sort of has to in order to show the life of someone in a game of cyberpunk or in the world of cyberpunk. You start at the bottom as a nobody, you get a taste for the life, you get into it, you build your reputation, you face hardships, you keep stacking chrome to keep yourself alive, and you do bigger and bigger jobs to keep paying for it and paying off your mistakes, and then you go out in a blood-soaked blaze of glory at the end if you're lucky. That's just how it goes, and David fulfills that role absolutely perfectly. Making him a smallish, dark-haired regular guy really works, because it always looks like he's trying to belong in a world that's way bigger than he is, and crazier than he is, until you get to episode 7. And suddenly he goes from boy to runner. And from that moment, you know his life can never be the same again, and the life of a runner has him, and those only end one way. And that's what I really like about this show, you pretty much get to see all the cyberpunk character archetypes you could possibly have. That's what Netrunners are. And you get to see a wheelman and fixers, you get the full experience. Which is another thing that cyberpunk can claim. They mastered how to do a hacking montage for real and make it actually exciting. You see Netrunners dive and break ice, that's great. You see, a wheelman doesn't do much until they're needed and then they're invaluable when you need them most. And then you get betrayed by someone in your crew for better money. That's just how it goes. Just like your fixer never tells you all the info you need to know, they always hold something back from you, and then that thing will cause things to go wrong, and then it's your fault that it goes wrong. And then in the end they trick you and try to get you killed and sell you out eventually. That's just a fixer, that's what happens. All the roles are perfect. And you could say they're stereotypes in this show pretty much, but they are. They are the exemplary stereotypes of those roles. To me, this was less an advertisement for the video game and more a quick rundown on how to play these characters in like a TTRPG. But that's where you get limitations. As much as people wanted more of this show, there's so many people saying this should be longer, and I agree. But if you did it again, if you did a second story, not only would you need a new crew, but it would be pretty much the same. This is every cyberpunk story. This is it at its core. You can operate at higher lower levels with more or less money in crazier or smaller jobs. You can be basically special ops or do devious thieving things or sneaky heists with high tech. But at the end of the day, all the stories here are the runners. There are games that explore more of this. You can be running a store or something in the cyberpunk world, but to watch a show, you want to be with the runners. You want to be with the coolness, and they all go the same way. The specifics change, but this is cyberpunk. The world is deep and rich, but there's nothing else you want to be doing. In fact, I do have one pitch. I have seen one really cool variation of this played in a TTRPG where the team was actually part of basically Max Tech. They were a team of anti-cyber psycho squad. They play basically the anti-cyber psycho people who are right on the edge. They get chromed out like crazy and then their missions are take down crazier and crazier psychos. That could be interesting to watch and it basically would turn this into cyberpunk cross with psycho pass, I guess, which could be cool, but it's just the details and maybe that's enough. Maybe I'm being pessimistic here, but you want to be focused on the cool runners and the runners might be cool, but they're always getting stepped on. They never totally win and in the end, it never turns out well. It's just everything that happens along the way. And even if you got series two, I'm not sure how different it could be. Not only would you need a whole new crew, that is assuming we actually let Lucy have an ending and don't bring her back because that kind of ruins it, but the next show would just be new runners with new cyberware which could be cool and a different objective but it's gonna be the same. Perhaps that sounds like an odd criticism, but it comes with the setting, and I think that's why it works so well to play in this setting. It's one of the reasons it thrives so well as a game, because you can move your players to different settings, but they're all pretty much doing the same thing, just at different levels and in different objectives. But hey, there's a million revenge action movies, so maybe I'm just totally barking up the wrong tree here. But to me, this is the quintessential cyberpunk experience. Speaking of the ending, I will give one note. As amazing as all of it was, and how beautiful but also sad the ending was, I would have given anything for the ending theme of the last episode to be a techno remix of Fly Me to the Moon. Come on guys, it was right there. I will also say I haven't talked about the animation a lot so far, and look, obviously it's incredible. It's where a lot of the praise for this show is coming from. Trigger have honed their craft. They're excellent at what they do. Every character looks memorable and great. The designs are awesome. The environment looks alive, and there's depth to everything. More than even usual, I think Trigger works great here. That bright, crazy color palette style that really works combined with the neon aesthetic of 
everything and the LED aesthetic of everything and the tech look to everything. It's a great way to work their style into this world. And the Dark City gives so many landscapes for shadows to contrast everything against. Even concepts we've seen very frequently across animated properties, such as characters leaving after images themselves, are done exceptionally here. I could go on and on about the animation, but there's so many people giving it praise and saying more than I ever could, and they're the things I would say anyway. It's awesome. Go watch it. If I'm honest, my biggest problem with this show has nothing to do with this show. And excuse the rant, it has to do with how this incredible piece of work will just now be gone. A total flash in the pan when it deserves so much more. Netflix does all these shows so dirty. And I know it's how they got popular as a service, but that binge model ruins all these things for me. These special shows. It's not just this. I'm watching Cobra Kai right now, and everyone has already moved on from it in a week. I just think back to Game of Thrones. Forget how it ended, forget all that. Just think of it as a show how phenomenal it was and how it changed the world of entertainment. And it did that by becoming a landmark in pop culture because everyone had to wait between episodes. Each week, everyone discussed. There was anticipation. It was the water cooler show everyone talked about all week until the next episode at work. These shows could be that, should be that. But instead, I'm making this video over a week after the release and I feel like I've already missed the hype. We should be talking about this show for two months, not two weeks. Netflix should be happy to get two months of subscriptions out of it to make people stick around to see the whole thing, rather than dumping budgets on these giant productions that go away for years on end to make these products and they put them out in a day, which at the most will get them one singular sign up to watch it all and leave again. I just will not understand why they still use this model. And that's not Cyberpunk's fault at all, but I thought I'd bring it up here. For sure, by the time we get to, like, December, this show will be brought up again in talks of the best show of the year in that group. But this is a short series, it would have been 10 weeks. That's not too much to ask. This deserves better. All these projects deserve to be treated better, deserve to leave a bigger impact, rather than making a giant splash for one day and vanishing, because they should be remembered more. And if they were, if they had as big an impact as they could have, you would see more projects like them, because people would become far more attached. It wouldn't just be here and gone again. In the end, this is a special show. It is a perfect show for showing someone what cyberpunk is. If you say what's cyberpunk, it is this show. And it doesn't pull any of its punches. It lets you know it's cyberpunk. Look at these awesome, wacky characters you love, and now watch them get unceremoniously killed in gory ways, just as part of the collateral damage. Your friend you loved, they're gone. That is far from a bad thing. That is what people remember, and that is cyberpunk. They say this in the show, that as a runner, your legend isn't made by how you live, it's how you die. Which is true in the show. But as a show, it's the opposite. This show's well-deserved praise is already dying too early, and despite not being the deepest or most unpredictable plot, and in fact is the opposite, it's a perfect example of a plot for cyberpunk, almost the perfect generic plot for the cyberpunk experience. It doesn't change the fact that that experience is exquisite. It's trippy, it's gory, it's confronting, it's shocking, it's cold, and yet at the center, there's love. Love between the characters, love for this world, love for this property, love for these ideas, and love for this style. The world is so harsh that you can't help but love these crazy characters and the people you spend your time with and your journey with, no matter how brief it is. You may always know how it's going to end, but unlike the runners, it is the journey for us. It's not the destination that we can predict, it's the ride that it takes us on that makes it a legend. And just like a runner, it may have ended here far too soon. I just wished it could have kept running a little longer. Is, is the video over? Did my dramatic outro work? Okay, now at the end. People love this show, and I love this show, and they kept up with it, it didn't throw anyone off. People seem to be on board with it, even with throwing crazy stuff at them. So, someone commission a Shadowrun show, please? If you don't know, Shadowrun is this. It's exactly this. It's cyberpunk, but it's also modern fantasy. So everything you see here, plus like, Lord of the Rings. It's all the cyberpunk, and the heads of the mega corporations, usually dragons, and there's elves, and orcs, and there's magic, as well as the cyberware. Wild. Somebody do it.
Oh, and don't even get me started on Cthulhu Punk, because that's a thing too. Anyway, until next time, my name is Rigo. I hope you had a wonderful day, and I hope I did alright.